Hello and welcome to this, my last YouTube video before I'm stripped of my registration. First of all, I apologise for the clickbait title, but it was too good an opportunity to pass up. In truth, this is a drug that I very rarely administer. I've made this video in order to clear up what I see as being some important misconceptions regarding this topic and regarding inhalational anaesthesia in general. We will briefly review the arguments for and against the use of desflurane then direct our attention to the factors affecting the rate of emergence from inhalational anaesthesia, some considerations regarding the justification or otherwise of desflurane, and finally a suggestion as to how this drug might be used. Regarding the arguments for the use of desflurane, there really only is one, and that is that offset from desflurane anaesthesia is very fast owing to its low partition coefficients. On the other hand, it's more expensive it is unsuitable for inhalational induction of anaesthesia due to irritation of the respiratory tract. It reacts with sodaline to form carbon monoxide. And as we now know, it has 20 times the global warming potential of the sevoflurane. In fact, one Mach hour of desflurane anaesthesia is equivalent to driving 300 kilometers. On the face of it, it would seem difficult to defend the use of this drug. Surely des would have to be much, much faster in offset than sevoflurane for us to bother using it at all. Well, let's find out. Maybe you have been told by a desflurane fanatic that desflurane is way faster than sevoflurane under all circumstances and should be administered from the beginning of every procedure. I put forth this is an absurd claim. You might also have been told by an environmentally conscious anaesthetist that in spite of its favorable physicochemical properties, emergence from desflurane anesthesia is only three minutes faster than from sevoflurane anesthesia. I contend this is an equally absurd claim. The disparity in emergence between these two drugs is proportional to the degree of uptake and the degree of compartment saturation that has occurred. The chief determinants of this are as follows. First of all, it depends upon the duration of anesthesia. To conduct a study of brief anesthesia with SIVA versus DES would be like having me line up against Usain Bolt for a three meter sprint run the experiment a handful of times and conclude that there is no statistically significant difference in our sprinting abilities. You can see in this graph taken from the textbook by Hemmings and Egan that the curve for sevoflurane's 90% decrement time takes a sharp upward turn at about the two hour mark, whereas for desflurane the curve remains flat. Following a typical anaesthetic augmented by adjuvants like benzodiazepines and opioids, the 90% decrement time is much more instructive than the context sensitive half time insofar as time to emergence is concerned. Second of all, the degree to which DES is faster than SIVO is highly dependent upon the steady state partial pressure relative to potency. To use a culinary analogy, we have here on the left a refrigerated helping of shepherd's pie and on the right a frozen piece of chicken pie. A powerful microwave is much more beneficial when reheating frozen food as compared with refrigerated food. A 10% reduction in heating time might save only 10 seconds for the shepherd's pie, but more than a minute for the chicken pie. Returning to anesthesia, the rapid offset kinetics of desflurane are far more significant after a freezer level anesthetic of 1.3 mac than after a fridge level anesthetic of 0.7 mac. Thirdly, the disparity in offset times between these two drugs is highly dependent upon the patient's cardiac output or in truth the rate of blood flow through the tissue compartments. In general there is much less to be gained by using desflurane in an older and frailer patient as compared with a younger and more vigorous patient assuming that we administer a MAC fraction appropriate for each group. Similar to that last curve we saw there is a sharp upward turn for the patient with a cardiac output of 6 litres per minute as compared with 4 litres per minute, again roughly at the 2 hour mark. The extent of disparity in uptake also depends upon the size of tissue compartments, particularly muscle given its relatively high capacity for uptake and its high perfusion rate. Notably, in the average morbidly obese patient, 20% of the excess mass is lean tissue, with the remainder being adipose. I want to demonstrate how these considerations can be important when reviewing the relevant literature. 
This article was published in the British Journal of Anesthesia in 2007. It involved morbidly obese patients undergoing weight loss surgery of about three hours duration. The upshot is that patients were extubated seven minutes earlier after a desflurane anesthetic compared with a sevoflurane anesthetic. We might conclude based on this study that DES doesn't have particularly much to offer. However, if we look a little closer, we find some factors that result in the difference being a lot less than what might be observed in other settings. In this study, sevoflurane and desflurane concentrations were titrated to achieve a bispectral index of between 40 and 50 and of 60 for the last 20 minutes of the case. This resulted in fairly low concentrations of anaesthetic being administered. The average concentration prior to discontinuation was only 1.3% for sevoflurane and 3.6% for desflurane. This was made possible by the use of a remifentanil infusion and paralysis with cisatricurium. Estimated remi concentrations were likewise quite low, and unfortunately the lean mass calculations and average infusion rates have not been included in this paper. I would consider this to be sailing close to the wind, especially given the fallibility of this monitoring in paralysed patients, although it must be emphasised that this fallibility was realised some years after the paper we are discussing. The question, of course, is how large would the disparity in time to extubation be if the patients had been administered a MAC of volatile or even 0.8 MAC rather than 0.6 MAC? It's hard to say for sure, but when the switch from the distribution phase to the terminal elimination phase happens at even half a percent of sevoflurane, emergence can take a very long time indeed. We all have slow wake-ups from time to time, just as we all miss IVs on occasion. In addition, the patients were not anaesthetized during the wash-in phase in the way we normally would. What the authors of this study did was administer a square wave of 1 mac for the first 30 minutes of the procedure, irrespective of the end tidal concentration of volatile agent. After 30 minutes, SIVO was reduced to 1 to 2 percent and DES to 3 to 4 percent, titrated against the BIST as described. However, what we generally do is overpressure the system so that the desired clinical effect is reached in time for knife to skin. Had the authors conducted the anaesthetic this way, there would have been even greater uptake of both drugs during the first 30 minutes than that which occurred in this study. In addition, the effect would have been more pronounced for sevoflurane owing to its slower rate of equilibration at valvular and inspired concentrations. As we all recall from the primary exam, Nitrous wins the gold medal for the fastest kinetics, Des wins the silver, and Sevo the bronze. To illustrate this point further, I once assisted a consultant who was maintaining anaesthesia for a Whipple's procedure using half a mac of desflurane and 50% nitrous oxide. After a six hour anaesthetic, the patient was extubated not a minute after the dressings had been applied. To summarize that which has been discussed so far, the pertinent questions relate not to the existence of a disparity between sevoflurane and desflurane, but rather to the variability in the extent of that disparity and the justification of desflurane's use. As for that justification, here is one way of approaching it. The first question one might ask oneself before switching the interlock is, does this patient actually need an awake extubation? If not, then switching to desflurane serves no purpose. The second question might be, how much faster will DES actually be for this patient undergoing this procedure? If the answer is only a couple of minutes, then there is probably no point using it. The third question might be, why do I want a rapid emergence? Here I will channel the states of legality in Ireland as described by Dara O'Brien. Am I using DES because it is night shift? and the current patient requires immediate assessment of neurological status upon emergence, and there is a woman waiting for a labor epidural, and another patient waiting for neck fasch debridement, and another for laparotomy, and another for exploration of a dusky Dieppe flap, meaning that every minute counts? Am I using DES because my other half may be promised to be home in time for dinner, or else? 
Or am I using DES because I want to get to the footy in time for the bounce? I would like to share with you what I consider to be a reasonable way to use DES for rain, assuming you have decided that its use is justified. Towards the end of a long anaesthetic, say one hour before the end of a four hour case, or two hours before the end of an eight hour case, turn the fresh gas flow rate down to about 750 milliliters per minute. Turn the sevofluorine vaporizer off, turn the desfluorine vaporizer on, coughing loudly to cover the beat noise. Set the desfluorine concentration at about 8% initially on your vaporizer, but wind it back by about 1% every few minutes, such that the desired additive MAC fraction is maintained. Often, a steady set of sorts is reached at about 3 or 4%. Once the procedure ceases to be stimulating, and provided the patient is no longer completely paralysed, the desfluorine vaporizer can be turned down further, or even off altogether, still with low fresh gas flow rate. Once it is time to wake the patient up, turn the vaporizer off, turn the fresh gas flow rate right up and start the clock. I should add that fresh gas flow rate only needs to be high until the inspired concentration of anaesthetic agent falls to zero. Beyond that point, six liters per minute is usually sufficient. The reason this technique works is that although sevofluorine and desfluorine share the inhalational route of administration and excretion, each drug is subject to its own concentration gradient. I want to draw your attention to a few details. During the tail end of the procedure, the patient receives predominantly a sevofluorine anaesthetic, despite us not vaporizing a single drop of it. Stated differently, by keeping fresh gas flows low, we are getting free mileage out of the absorbed sevofluorine. In fact, there is a relatively short period of time during which desfluorine is being vaporized, and even then at a low rate. Now, one might say, just wind the sevo down earlier. But this statement presupposes that the patient was receiving an unnecessarily high concentration of anaesthetic. The approach I'm recommending should be employed in addition to administering no more than the amount of anaesthetic necessary at each given time point. One might also say, just switch to propofol rather than desfluorine, in which case I would say yes, by all means, and I've done that plenty of times myself. But maybe your IV is not running so well. Maybe you forgot to attach a chook foot and you've run out of IV ports. Maybe you are unable to apply bisprobe. Valuable as it is, it's the best we've got for propofol. Or maybe you judge that Desrain's lightning fast kinetics are warranted on this occasion. In summary, Desfluorine has very favorable offset kinetics and this becomes significant in certain circumstances. Desfluorine is also a costly atmospheric toxin. How to square these facts against each other is something I will let you ponder for yourself. Thank you for listening. I look forward to seeing some robust discussions in the comments below.